Um, good evening. It's really um, a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I have to say, I've given many lectures and I've never been introduced quite that way. <laughs> and I've also never had quite as much of a fire hazard for my audience. Um, can I just ask that you lower that light because I get headaches and if it's that bright, I will not make it through the lecture. So if you could lower that light a little bit, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so um, despite the introduction, I'm going to have very boring slides, but I'm gonna tell you about some very exciting things that we know about the universe, about what's in it, and what it might be made of, and what we know has happened over time, and what we think might have happened over time. So um, there's really two parts. I mean, this talk is really an outline of some of the stuff that's in my book, uh, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, coincidentally enough. Um, and really, the subtitle is really what the book is about, in my mind. I mean, I'm going to tell you uh, the outline of the ideas underlying the research that I've done, that I used to frame the book. But really, what I learned in doing this research was just the amazing connections between fundamental particles, things that seem so abstract and foreign, and things that are really out there in the universe. And for me, that was one of the reasons I decided to write this book, because it, you know, I've written books about things like the Higgs boson and um, elementary particles, and it's really abstract and really hard to do. And so th I like the idea that we can make these connections that go all the way from elementary particles to how the universe evolved, to what our galaxy looks like, to the solar system, and even to life itself. And that's basically what I say here. There's also one other thing that um, was part of the reason I want to write this book, which is that we're changing the globe quite a lot today. And I thought, while we do so, and while we're understanding things, it's very important to understand what went into it, what the history of the universe is over its billions of years, what the history of the Earth is, and what the history of life is. Um, because these things evolved slowly, or changed slowly, yet we're changing things very rapidly here. And it just gives a nice context and a good way to think about some of these things. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about dark matter. So I actually made the talk a little more physics-y than I usually do, but I thought it was important to know why we're thinking about it. So I'll tell you what dark matter is in a minute. I'll tell you all about it. But I just want you to realize before I even start that this is not speculation. That is to say, we know dark matter exists. Um, there's many observations of its gravitational influences, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what they are. And not only do we not know that there is dark matter, there's five times the amount of energy carried by dark matter as ordinary matter. And just to anticipate, dark matter is stuff that's not made of the usual stuff. It's not made, that is to say, the familiar stuff. It's not made out of atoms. It doesn't carry any of the familiar charges, as far as we know. It interacts via gravity. And if it was just an individual dark matter particle, we'd know nothing about it. It's because there's a lot of it out there that we observe its gravitational influences. And um, there's probably billions of dark matter particles going through you every second, and you don't know about it. And that's because it interacts so little with you. But we really do know that dark matter exists, and we're trying to figure out what it really is. What is it? That is to say, what do we mean by that? We don't know what it is in the sense of, is it a fundamental particle? What do we even mean by knowing what that particle is? We mean knowing its properties. What is its mass? What are its charges? Does it have any interactions? Does it interact with ordinary matter at all that we haven't seen yet? Does it interact with itself in ways that we haven't seen because we're not d the dark matter? Um, is it even a single particle? And that's sort of a key question for our research. You know, we, we're, the, when you do research in particle physics or anything that's on the edge, you realize how much hubris there is. You know, even though we've had the Copernican revolution, 
we know we're not the center of the universe, we nonetheless get surprised every time we find out that there's a lot of stuff out there that's not what we're familiar with. And we also tend to assume that that's much simpler than what we see. But just think, if we were dark matter people, looking at our world, we would get it all really wrong if we said it was just one particle. Think of all the complex complexity that goes into the stuff that we're made of. And maybe dark matter has some complexity that we just don't know about yet. So again, what do we mean by dark matter? It's dark matter that interacts via gravity. It's matter that interacts via gravity. And what do I mean by matter? Matter is stuff that interacts with gravity, like matter. <laughs> Sounds circular, but that's really what it is. So that means that it's stuff that would clump into galaxies, clump into galaxy clusters. Um, it's not spread out diffusely through the universe, like something called dark energy that you might have heard of. Dark energy is very different. It's just uniform in space, and probably also in time whereas dark matter is stuff that clumps together. And like I said, billions of dark matter particles might be passing through every second. You don't see them. Not only do you not see them, you don't feel them. You'd ha they don't interact with our senses in any way because it doesn't have the standard usual interactions that we do, that we know about. And I also want to add one other thing, which is that it's not actually dark. Dark stuff absorbs light. That's why it's dark. This stuff, it's transparent. Light just passes through it, okay? So it's out there, it interacts via gravity, but as far as we know, it doesn't have interactions. And one of the things we want to know is, does it have interactions that we don't yet know about, okay? The other thing about dark matter is that, you know, just like all the other underrepresented classes of society, it actually was critical to our universe. It actually gave structure to our universe. It kind of was the reason we're here in the lifetime of the universe. Um, had dark matter not been around, I'll say a little bit more about that, it, stuff like galaxies wouldn't have even formed in the lifetime of the universe, and we wouldn't be around here having this conversation. So again, because some of the stuff I'm going to tell you about is speculative research, and because people always get confused because it's, they think it's such an exotic concept, I want to say that we actually know that dark matter exists. We don't see it with our eyes, but we observe its gravitational influences. And I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons why we know it's there. Um, but and one of them just has to do with the fact that measuring velocities, the speed of stars in the Milky Way galaxy or in any galaxy, you find that the velocity is so big that if there weren't more matter pulling it in, it would just fly off. It would just fly away, and it wouldn't be bound together. So you can conclude from how fast things are, are moving within a galaxy or a galaxy cluster. A galaxy cluster is a bunch of galaxies that's gravitationally bound together, that there has to be matter we don't see. Without it, stuff would fly apart. And that's actually one of the first ways people knew that there had to be some stuff that we just didn't see. Um, now, just to anticipate, a lot of people say, okay, that's fine, but you're just using your equations. So maybe your equations are wrong. Maybe Einstein's theory of gravity is wrong. And, you know, it's possible, but Einstein's gravity has been very well tested, and it's been really well tested on these scales. Um, furthermore, it's much more radical to say that Einstein's equations of gravity are wrong than to say that there's matter we don't see. I mean, from a personal point of view, we might be very upset that we don't see it, but there's really no reason that that stuff can't be out there. All it says is it's not made up of atoms. It's not made up of stuff that interacts via the charges we know. And there's really no reason that that stuff can't be there. In fact, if you really asked me what I thought, I'd say the surprising thing is that the matter we know about makes up 15% of the matter of the universe. It didn't have to be there. It could have been a fraction. It could have been a tiny fraction of the universe. So what's really interesting is that the amount of dark matter and ordinary matter are as similar as they are. The amount of energy carried by dark matter is about five times the amount of ordinary matter, which maybe is a clue to what it is, because in principle it could have been a trillion times more or a billion times less. It could have been really different, but in fact they're very similar, which maybe is some clue as to what's going on, which I find interesting. 
Um, so those are, those, those are a couple of ways that we, well, as I told you, the rotations of stars, or the movement of stars is one way we know about dark matter. But let me tell you a couple of others, just because I think they're really interesting, and sort of give you a better feel that it really is matter. And this just says what I said before, that dark matter makes up five times the amount of matter as ordinary matter. And the rest is dark energy, which is something totally different, even though they use the name dark in both. Okay, so how else do we know about dark matter? Well, I really like this. It looks a little bit confusing, perhaps, in this slide, but it's a really interesting thing. And it's known as gravitational lensing. So what's going on here? Let's see if I can get this to work again. There we go. Okay. So here's something dark. It could be light, but let's just assume we don't see it. It's something dark. Here's a star. That isn't dark. A star emits light, okay? So what happens to the light as it comes to us? We're over here looking at the star. Well, we know that there is gravity exerted by this object, and if there's enough of it, it will bend the light in a noticeable way. So this light is going around it, and it's bending. On the other hand, some of the light goes this way and bends in a different direction. Now, we don't think light is bending, so we would just project it and think, okay, here's the star over here from this light, and here's the star over there because we looked at this light. So what you end up seeing is either multiple images of the same object or a spread out lensed version of it. And this I like because it really kind of maps out the dark matter distribution. By seeing this lensing effect, it really gives the feeling that there really is matter that is causing this to happen. And this is even more explicit in something known as the bullet cluster. Now the bullet cluster, remember I said a, a cluster of galaxies is a bunch of galaxies that are bound together by gravity. So it's a bunch of galaxies moving around each other. Now the bullet cluster actually wasn't a single cluster in the beginning. It was merging of different clusters that formed it. Now what happens when clusters merge is that the stuff in them, of course, merges. And what's in a cluster of galaxies? Well, there's going to be stars, there's going to be galaxies, there's going to be stars, there's going to be gas, and there's going to be dark matter. So what would you expect to happen when two of these got together? Well, gas interacts. Gas is ordinary matter. It has all the interactions we know about. It gets kind of stuck, this like friction, if you like. So the gas gets stuck in the middle. That's kind of this pink part here. But the dark matter, which are these blue lobes on the end, is stuff that they detect because of gravitational lensing. And that just went right through, which indicates it didn't interact with the gas. And moreover, it didn't interact a whole lot with itself. So this bullet cluster is a strong indication that it really is matter, because that's exactly what you would expect from matter as it went through, matter that doesn't have a lot of interactions. So in addition to my predilection to thinking Einstein's gravity is right, I'd say that this is really strong evidence that it really is some form of matter, and we'd like to know what it is. And um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I do want to say that it's very cool to follow what happens as in the cosmology of the universe as the universe evolved in the presence of this dark matter. And people do simulations on computers to see what happens. And what you find is that, oops, what you find is that um, it's, you sort of get these regions Although these, this is the, the light regions, ironically, are the dark matter, but that's not really a surprise. Because what happens is the dark matter forms structure. And by structure, I mean stuff. I mean like this Milky Way galaxy, stuff that is much denser than most of the regions of the sky. So what happens is, you know, the way it works everywhere, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So once you start to form structure, it begins to attract more and more matter. And moreover, the regions that don't have matter sort of accelerate away from each other, so they get bigger. So you get these voids in between regions with matter. And then those regions intersect, and then here's where you might have a galaxy cluster. Why is it light? Because that's where there's a lot of gravity, because there's a lot of matter there. So actually what happens is that ordinary matter kind of piggybacks on the dark matter, it kind of hitchhikes, it comes along for the ride. So it's not a coincidence 
that when we see the light regions of the sky, it's also where we expect there to be dark matter. Not precisely the same locations, but in the general vicinity, because, or after all, ordinary matter has other interactions, it can do other things. But basically, they went in together. So in this particular case, in some sense, looking under the lamppost is actually the correct thing to do, because you expect to find dark matter where there's also light matter. But let's now focus in on our Milky Way, okay? So the Milky Way, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a halo of dark matter. So dark matter is more or less spherical. It's not exactly spherical, but it's more or less spherical. There's a disk of dark matter, of, sorry, of ordinary matter inside, okay? So there's dark matter, all the ordinary matter came in. But remember, ordinary matter is different. It's different because of many interactions, but interactions that allow it to radiate. So if matter can radiate, it can cool down. And if it cools down, it can collapse, and it collapses into this disk. So the reason that you have this nice Milky Way, um, which you see if you're on a clear, dry night, you can look out and see this dense regions that looks milky. That, um, so, um, those of you who eat candy, one of the interesting things I found out when I wrote this book is that Milky Way candy bar is not actually named after the Milky Way, despite the deceptive wrapping on the dark chocolate version. It was actually named after a milkshake, because it was supposed to taste like a milkshake. But the Milky Way galaxy actually looks like this. <laughs> um, and so this is where ordinary matter is. But this is an important thing, because ordinary matter, there's a lot less of it than dark matter. But because it collapsed, it's much denser. And because it can interact, it can do all sorts of interesting things, like form stars and solar system, and you know, ultimately us. It's, that, it's the fact that it was denser, that it interacts, that allows all this to happen. So even though ordinary matter is a small fraction of the dark matter, in terms of the energy it carries, of course, there's all this interesting stuff that's happening here. OK. So people want to know what dark matter is. Um, some, I'm only put this up because probably a lot of you have heard of something called WIMPs, which are weakly interacting massive particles. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Um, but it's, it's a candidate that particle physicists like, because it's saying maybe dark matter isn't something totally different. Maybe dark matter is something that happens in like an extension of the stuff we know about the standard model. So since you all are diligent attendees of these, you probably know about the Higgs boson. So some people think that maybe there's a dark matter particle. That's part of an extension of the theory that the Higgs boson lives in, and maybe even has mass around the same mass as the Higgs boson. And the reason people think that is because if it did, if you just track the cosmological history, you would have just right, about the right amount of energy carried by this stuff to be the dark matter that we see. But the other reason people like it is because if it really is true, there's more interaction between dark matter and ordinary matter than there would otherwise be. So it's something they can look for. So in this case, looking under the lamppost might not be the correct thing to do because there's a big assumption about what the dark matter actually is. And so one of the things that's been guiding my research is asking the question, suppose all these people have been wrong all these years and it's not wimps. Can we find that, too? Is there anything interesting that would happen in that case? Um, before I do that, though, I just want to tell you that there's a lot of stuff looking for those kind of particles right now, and they haven't found it yet, which is one of the reasons, motivate, one of the things motivating the research. But, um, but one of the things is detectors deep underground in mines or tunnels to protect it from cosmic radiation. One thing is stuff looking out in the sky for dark matter annihilating and turning into things we can see. And the other is a large hadron collider where you might actually produce it if it is related to the Higgs particle. But if it's not related to the Higgs particle, none of these things are gonna find it and we have to think harder about what it can be. So I do model building. I think about what are alternatives? What are other things that you might have? So you want to think about characterizing the possibilities, which has the advantage that one, it gives us new ways to think about these things, and two, 
it helps us identify new ways we might test for dark matter that we hadn't thought about before. As I said, we don't know what dark matter is. Um, we actually don't know what dark energy is, and we actually don't even know why ordinary matter is still around. So there's a lot of cosmological questions that we have. But I really like focusing on dark matter because I think it's the most likely to be tested experimentally and observationally, and it's the focus of many new ideas, one of which I'm going to tell you about. So my recent research, I say, Maybe dark matter isn't just one thing. It's not really that radical an assumption. If you look at our world, there's many different types of particles. Maybe in the dark sector, too, there's more than one type of particle. And in fact, maybe there's a portion, a small portion even, like 5% of, of the total dark matter, that interacts. And it doesn't interact via our forces. Maybe the dark sector interacts via its own light, which I like to call dark light. So maybe our sector has our own light and dark matter has its own light as well. And maybe it's not all of the matter. And again, you know, the people who criticize this kind of thing, they think, first of all, we haven't seen most of the dark matter. Why would we care about something that's only a small fraction? But the failing of that logic is pretty obvious because by that reasoning, you'd say, why do we care about ordinary matter? which also carries only a small fraction of the energy. And the reason is because it interacts and does a lot of cool stuff that allows us to see it. So that's really not a very good argument. The, and the real argument that you want to think about this is that you might actually, just like we see ordinary matter, but not dark matter, maybe we'll see this interacting component before we see the rest of it. So it's really something worth thinking about and figuring out if it's, if it's really true. And as, as I'm going to tell you about, it, it really affects what the solar system looks like, or how it acts, at least the galaxy and how it might act. And it could even possibly, and this is highly speculative, I admit, but really interesting and, and made me learn a lot of cool stuff. It could possibly trigger comet strikes, one of which might have killed the dinosaurs, and that's where the dinosaurs are going to come into the story. Okay, But again, the basic insight is simple. Why should normal matter be the only type of matter that's special? Um, maybe dark matter isn't just one particle. Maybe it too has its own charge and its own light. And the other thing is that one reason I really enjoyed this research and actually writing this book is because it really brings in a lot of different types of science. I mean, I work on elementary particle physics, and not only that, I would do theoretical work on elementary particle physics. And for a lot of people, that's fairly abstract. It's fairly removed from their everyday life. It underlies everything you see, don't get me wrong, but you don't need to know about it. But in doing this, it was able to connect to other types of science, and the tests for this, a lot of them come more from astronomy, looking out at the sky, not necessarily from particle accelerators, but from looking just out and seeing how matter is distributed. And also, in thinking about the dinosaurs and writing about that, I got to learn a lot of paleontology about the solar system. It turns out there's been a lot of advances in that since I went to high school, too. So it was, it was fun to be able to put all that together. Okay. So what happens if you have this interacting dark matter? Well, remember I said that the reason we have the Milky Way disk of ordinary matter is because it radiates. It emits energy. It can cool down. Well, in this case, the dark matter would be able to do the same thing, because at least that fraction of the dark matter then interacts. So you still have the normal dark matter distribution, you still have the normal halo from most of the dark matter, but this small portion that interacts with light can radiate. So what you end up with is a dark matter disk inside the Milky Way disk. The thing that we didn't know, and actually no one knew when we started this research, because no one had thought about this question, is if the dark matter particle is heavier than a proton, this disk is likely to be thinner than the Milky Way disk. And if that's true, this dark matter would be in a thin, dense disk. So even if there's less total matter, if it's in a small enough region, it would be much denser. 
So it, again, could be very interesting. So um, why is that interesting? Well, many reasons. One about one, it was very interesting for the dinosaurs, maybe. But it's also interesting from the point of view of astronomical observations, one of which I'm just telling you on this slide, but there's many, many. Um, some of which those of you who go to the seminar tomorrow will hear about, um, or the colloquium, I guess. Um, but if there's a dark disk, it affects the motion of stars because after all, it exerts gravity. So if you have stars that are moving up and down near the plane of the Milky Way or in the plane of the Milky Way, they would be sensitive to how matter is distributed. So this isn't just an abstract possibility. There's a real way to test whether it's there or not, which is to measure the position and velocity of stars and figure out is it consistent or does it seem to require this dark matter disk. And I have to say, from the point of view of being a particle physicist, this was a lot of fun for us because those of you who followed it know that it took, for example, 50 years for the Higgs boson to be discovered after it was proposed. Particle physics experiments take a long time. We were just very happy because we, had, we thought about this a few years ago um, during the summer. And that very fall, a satellite called the Gaia satellite was set to launch. And what is the Gaia satellite doing? It's a European mission, by the way. It's measuring the position and velocities of a billion stars in our Milky Way very precisely. In other words, they're doing exactly the measurement we would have requested if we could to figure out what is the gravitational potential in the Milky Way and figure out whether or not there's evidence for this dark disk. So we're very excited about this. But since we advertised the talk with dinosaurs, I'm going to tell you about that too. So I'm going to change gears now um, and tell you a bit about our solar system because that's what was critical. So here's a, a picture of the solar system. It's a little bit schematic, but it's pretty good. Um, so you have the four rocky inner planets, you have the four gaseous outer planets, but you also have a lot of other stuff in the Milky Way that we really don't pay that much attention to, but we're beginning to pay more attention to. There's the asteroid belt. There's actually a lot of different asteroids belts, and I talk all about them in my book. I don't know have time to tell you all about them here. But roughly speaking, most of the asteroids are in this belt between Mars and Jupiter. And what are asteroids? Well, they're basically pieces of rock. That's really all they are. They're not even round. They're just pieces of rock. They vary in size, and there's a lot of them. Um, most of them stay around here, but sometimes they come into Earth. There's near-Earth asteroids. Sometimes they come nearby. There's actually, the smaller you get, the more stuff hits the Earth. And I actually talk about the rate at which stuff hits the Earth, which was something I was wondering about, because you hear a lot about it and because, of course, I'm going to talk about a very big object that hit the Earth. Um, but that big object actually didn't come from the asteroid belt. It also doesn't come from the Kuiper belt, which is beyond Neptune. And there's also something called the scattered disk, which is very close to the Kuiper belt, which is a little bit more unstable. The Kuiper belt is a source of short period comets. Comets with periods, that is to say, they come around less than every 200 years. But in addition to this, okay, so this is about 30 times as far away from the sun as the Earth. But in addition to this, there's something called the Oort cloud, which is the source of long period comets. And it's in this spherical distribution, roughly speaking. It comes from all directions. It's not just the plane of the Milky Way. And it's about you know, thousands of times farther away from the sun than the Earth, what we call astronomical units. It's a good fraction of a light year away. So it's much, much farther away than the Earth is from the sun. But that means that the sun exerts much less gravity on it. It's bound, but we know that gravity goes like one over distance squared, the strength. So something a thousand times farther away would have a million times less the force of gravity. So the stuff there is bound to the sun but it's only weakly bound, which means if anything gives it a kick, it could dislodge it from its orbit and either send it outside the solar system altogether or to come hurtling in towards the inner solar system. So when those ha that happens, it's more likely that something will hit the Earth. It's not guaranteed to hit the Earth, but when things are more likely to get kicked, 
you have things more likely to hit the earth. Pretty cool. And stuff really does hit the earth. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and this is probably one of the best preserved. It's not the biggest. This is something called the Barringer or the Meteor Crater. It's an impact crater, which is to say it's not formed from a volcano. It was formed from an impact. It was formed from something hitting the earth. It's about a kilometer across. Um, and it's actually, there's many interesting stories associated with understanding that stuff does hit the earth and that this particular thing hurt the earth. In fact, it was pretty recent um, when people, when scientists finally began to believe that stuff hits the earth. I mean, if you think about it, it sounds a little nuts, right? You know, stuff is coming in from the sky and hitting the earth. It doesn't sound that sensible necessarily. Um, and in fact, when farmers and shepherds actually would see stuff come from the sky and hit the earth because they were outside. Um, and the scientists poo-pooed it. They actually didn't believe them for a long time. And in fairness, you know, they also had a lot of crazy theories. So, you know, there was reason to be suspicious. But then actually something fell in front of the Academy of Siena, <laughs> the Scientific Academy. And so they, they had to be convinced. And so at that point, they decided stuff really was falling. And um, this one is also really interesting um, because this particular one, um, you know, people didn't know if it was a volcano or, or an impact crater. And in fact, um, they were kind of unlucky because it happens to be near a volcanic field where there's a lot of volcanoes. So people thought this might be a volcano. Um, someone named Daniel Barringer, Barringer, I actually don't know how to pronounce his name, I've only read it. But he was a mining engineer and a businessman. And so when they found something that he, they thought was an iron meteorite, that is to say an iron remnant of something hitting, he got very excited because he thought there would be this huge trove of iron. After all, look at how big this crater is. If something fell that big, um, that would be amazing. Um, that's because he didn't know how craters were actually formed. No one actually knew how they were formed at the time. Um, so he invested a lot of money because he thought this would be a good business proposition. And he also wanted to convince people that it really had been something hitting the earth. And um, in the end of the day, because he didn't understand how these things are formed, he did manage to convince people it was an impact crater, but he lost a lot of money in the process. And that's because this huge gaping hole is not just something that hits. And in fact, one of the mysterious things about it, if you look at it, and this is one of the fun things that I had learning about and writing about, is it's round. And you know, if you th odds are if something's hitting the earth, it's coming from a particular direction. So you would think it wouldn't be round, but it's not, that's not how it's formed. It's formed because what happens is it hits the earth, there's a shock wave from the, releasing the pressure, and it's basically an explosion. So what happens is then stuff is emitted, it's lost, it vaporizes. So rather than have a whole lot of iron around here, there was basically a little bit of iron that they found in the vicinity. And this is well preserved and you can go visit it. And if you wanna know about other impact craters, there's something called the Earth Impact Database. It's on the web. You can actually go and look up all the things that have been identified as impact craters, how old they are, how big they are. And, um, and my collaborator, Matthew Reese, and I were interested in basically ones that are relatively recent, which we took to be 250 million years. So, so we looked at the impact craters from the last 250 million years, and we also were interested in the big impact craters. And by big, I mean bigger than 20 kilometers. So that means a rock of at least a kilometer in size hit the Earth. And so, although there are probably a bunch of these that have hit, most of them don't leave a record on the Earth because they either fall in the ocean or they erode away. I mean, so there's actually about 26 of them that meet those criteria. We wanted big ones because stuff hits the Earth all the time. That stuff hits randomly. We wanted big ones that we might have some systematic thing that we could say about it. So we looked at the set and we asked the question, is there any pattern to how they fall? Do they fall on a periodic basis or do they also just fall randomly? And it looked like there is some periodic um, time over which they fall, maybe every 30 million years or so. And that to us is extremely interesting. And in fact, that wasn't an original observation. Other people had been debating whether or not this was the case for years. Um, with a model, you have a way that you can think about it a little more carefully. 
And it looks like there is some evidence this is true. It's not completely convincing, but it does look like it's true. Now, why would we be interested in this question if we're thinking about dark matter? Well, let's go back to the thing about a dark matter disk. Again, the slide might be a little bit hard to see, but here's the Milky Way. There's this dark matter disk that's kind of slightly darker gray. Now, the solar system, that is to say the sun and all the planets around it, and the asteroids, and the Oort cloud, all of it, goes around the solar system about every 250 million years. It's a long time, right? It's only gone around about 50 times during its lifetime. But as it does so, it goes up and down a little bit, um, kind of like horses on a carousel as it goes around. Every time it goes through the Milky Way, it's going to encounter this dense disk of dark matter, if our theory is right. And what that would do would be to exert some gravitational tidal force that would actually disrupt the Oort cloud. So every time it passes through, you would be more likely to see comets that come and hit the Earth, and it could be big objects. So if our theory is right, we would actually think there might be periodic comet strikes about every 30 or 32 million years, something like that. Okay, finally, the connection to the dinosaurs. So suppose it's true that you are more likely to get these comet impacts about every 32 million years. Well, the other thing that was really interesting to learn about was all the extinctions that have happened on the Earth. And there's been five major extinctions in the, what's known as the Phanerozoic Eon, which is about 540 million years ago. That's basically post-Cambrian, -Cam or Cambrian and later. It's when fossils could start to form, when things really, when we really got to, began to get a very good fossil record. Actually, one of the things I found really interesting was, although the fossil record is really incomplete, there was so much life that you can really statistically put together a lot of information and find out about all these transition periods. And in particular, you can find out about the five major mass extinctions, which are times when half to two-thirds or more of the species on the planet disappeared. Major resets for the conditions for life. Life didn't just smoothly evolve over its 540 million years of complex life. There were these five major resets, the most dramatic of which is actually the Permian-Triassic, which seems coincidentally enough to be associated with a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's something we really do want to study and pay attention to. But the most recent one is known as the Cretaceous Paleogene. Um, that's one that happened 66 million years ago. There's also talk that we might be going through one now, and I can discuss that. But things, life does seem to be disappearing more rapidly, but it's the, you know, we have yet to decide that. But 66 million years ago, between these two different periods, most of the life on the planet disappeared, including the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs had lasted over 100 million years, but they disappeared at that time, at least the land ones. Birds are, in some sense, descended from dinosaurs, but the land-dwelling ones disappeared. And this is called um, Cretaceous Paleogene. Um, that's be Cretaceous actually comes from chalk. It's actually Cretan Earth. And that's because one of the ways we know about it is you can look at limestone. And if you look at limestone from this time period, you see it's very white, and then there's a layer of clay, and then it's gray above. And that's because everything that formed the fossils has disappeared. So it's this very clear distinction, and it was found all over the globe. And there's an amazing story of how that clay was the clue that led scientists figure out that it was actually because of an impact. Basically, there was so much iridium in that layer of clay that it couldn't be accounted for what was on the surface of the Earth. It had to have come from space. And once that was decided, there was an amazing story of how the actual crater was found which is really lucky because, as I said, most stuff that hits the Earth falls in the ocean. So the fact that this was able to be identified was very lucky and took about 10 years. And also the geological surveys from a Mexican oil company to put all this together. 
So it's, it's a really, really great story. And actually right now, they're going back to the Yucatan, which is where this crater is, and actually doing further drilling to learn more about it. So even now we're learning more about this extinction. But it's very clear that this extinction was associated with an object that hit the Earth. How big was that object? It was about 10 to 15 kilometers in size, which I'm guessing is a lot bigger than Copenhagen. Um, it's pretty enormous. Um, and it was also traveling at, at least probably 30 kilometers per second, not per hour, per second. So it was something very big and very fast that hit the Earth. And as you might imagine, that can do a lot of damage. And indeed it did. And it, I like to joke, but it was actually true, that it's basically every disaster movie scenario except for a zombie apocalypse. I mean, you have fires, you have earthquakes, you have tsunamis, you have acid rain, you have clouds covering the sun. I mean, every bad thing can happen. So it's not all that surprising that life would have a major reset and most of life would disappear. And in fact, had it not been for the extinction of the dinosaurs, it's not clear we would be here talking about it because what it did is allow mammals to develop. I mean, before that, mammals were small, living underground. Basically, once the dinosaurs were gone, they could develop into the creatures that we are today. So in some sense, we have this meteoroid to thank, perhaps a comet, to thank for the fact that we're here. And I'm, I like to show this slide because a lot of people are kind of skeptical about working on these crazy theories. Um, in some sense, it's a crazy theory, but in some sense, it's a real theory because, as I said, you can really test it. And the reason I like to show it is that, um, so I have some friends who are writers on the Big Bang Theory. Maybe some of you watch it. Um, and, and so one day I was visiting the set and they said, why don't you just be an extra and just sit in the cafeteria? And my um, directions were um, that I should be very inconspicuous. So apparently I'm a really, really good actor because most people didn't notice I was there. But if you see this slide, you see I'm right there in the slide. Um, I was right there. But the fact is, unless you know to look for something, you often miss it. And that's true, I mean, this is a pretty obvious example, but think about science where you're looking at, you know, the Higgs particle, it's one out of a billion events. If you don't know to look for it, you're probably not gonna find it, or it's gonna take you a very long time to find it. So I like to think that one of the reasons we do model building and come up with these crazy theories is because maybe some of them are right, and it makes us understand better what we do know is there and what we don't know is there. So I'm just gonna conclude with a few slides somewhat relating to some of the other ideas that are in my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, which have to do with a lot of the other connections that exist. Um, you know, most of you probably know that a lot of the heavy elements were formed from supernova, that without those stars, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have the elements of life, the heavy elements of life. Um, but, you know, the star burning and this composition is determined by nuclear forces. Oddly enough, as is our planet's geology, again, a connection I'd never thought about before. But if you think about it, you know, we have plate tectonics on the surface of the Earth. The plates are moving. What drives that motion is actually the fact that there's nuclear decay in the center of the Earth, which is actually drives. So you have these connections between these sort of basic elements, these nuclei, and the fact that there's plate tectonics, which is in turn, in large part, responsible for the carbon cycle that, of course, is responsible for life. These are amazing connections, and as I said, maybe this other one is true, that large mammals emerged only after the dinosaurs were eliminated, and maybe this comet that hit was actually triggered by a dark matter disk. So I'd say for me, the four things that I really learned or felt when writing this book were that things can move on their own without my saying anything. <laughs> for my next magic trick, I'm gonna tell you how dark matter was responsible for that. Um, so, um, so what I wanted to say is that there's a few things I learned. I mean, one is just, if, you know, I, I tend to focus a lot on the sort of nuts and bolts of how we get where we are in science, but there really are some remarkable connections that it's worth appreciating about life, the Earth, the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe, and it's really worth investigating them. And the other thing that really is amazing in many way, respects is how much we've learned about that in the last, say, 50 years. All of these things, there's been enormous advances, and it's really fun to uh, dive into them and to be part of them and to learn about them. 
The other thing was how many fields of science entered into all of these discoveries. Um, the story of the extinction of the dinosaurs in particular, you know, it wasn't just geologists and paleontologists. It was a physicist who suggested, why not look at irid iridium to, to measure how long it took for this extinction to happen. It was nuclear chemists that could go back and look and see, make sure it wasn't a supernova or something else that came from the space. So there really were many fields of science that enter. Um, like I said, a lot of this is pretty recent. I mean, it's really the last 50 years and even less that a lot of this was figured out. But the other thing that's important in, under, in all of the scientific advances has been debates over how quickly things happen. That's true in some sense about cosmology. Do things evolve slowly or quickly? Was there an explosive phase in the beginning? It was also true, I mean, it was really interesting to see the debates that happened basically around the time Darwin put forward his theory. And Cuvier put forward a theory about extinctions. Extinctions itself was not obvious until only, you know, people didn't really believe this happened until maybe a few hundred years ago or less. And so Darwin thought everything happened slowly. Cuvier thought everything happened quickly, cataclysmically. And of course, it's a combination of the two, as those five major extinctions shows you. Some things happen quickly and some things happen slowly. And understanding how quickly those things happen tells us a lot about what the underlying process was. Like, for example, was it a big rock hitting the earth that caused it to happen? So these are just two photos that I like to show because it really was, I was amazingly lucky because I happened to be giving a physics lecture at the University of the Basque Country in Bilbao and they took me on a nice walk by the seaside and one of the physicists there whose cousin is a geologist said, oh, do you know the KPG layer, the one associated with the extinction of the dinosaurs is right nearby? And he told me this without knowing I was working on this book about, or even this theory about the dinosaur extinction. He knew I was working on dark matter, but not the other part. So we went on an outing the next day. This is the director of the scientific park, and we are looking there at this actually very layer from 66 million years ago, where this is thin layer of clay and the light rock and then dark rock above it. And if that's not enough reason to visit, it is actually one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen. So, um, but this is actually a really interesting place because this rock is actually used to study a lot of geological history. It spans around 50 million years. It's really quite amazing. So to conclude, almost, I don't know if the dark disk is right, but people are looking for it and the Gaia survey is going on. Um, there's lots of ways we can know about it. I uh, could tell you a lot more about other things. So I don't know if that's right, but I do know we're going to learn more about some amazing connections in the universe and ultimately to life. And if you want to learn more, um, there's copies of my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs. Thank you very much.